I'm going to use a very. Ready? So this is on. It's on? It's on, right? Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. I hope you all have a very good lunch. So now we start our afternoon session. So it's really a great honor to have uh, Jeff here. So I'm going to actually do a very, um, instead of, I've never done before. Normally when I introduce the keynote speaker, I always read off the kind of a piece of paper to say how great this person it is. Actually, I don't know Jeff personally. But I want to use the personal story to kind of share with you the part of uh, Jeff I know of actually through <coughs> third parties. So of course, you guys probably, most of you have known, Jeff is a Google fellow, and also he's the designer and also the implementer for some of the very big name systems, uh, like a Google search engine and big table, and I think a, a map reduce, right? But the, those things you can read uh, on the web, you can Google him, you can just go to his webpage. That's why I said that that's not the things I want to talk about. The things I want to know, I want to actually share with you this. So my husband joined Google about, uh, maybe after three months he joined Google. By the way, my husband thinks he's one of the greatest engineers too. Then he said, uh, you know, this world uh, just has so many great people, smart people. They're smarter, greater than I am. And I hate it, right? Basically, I said, who are you talking about? Then he said, oh, in Google, because we can see everybody's code. Right? I know what they have built, they have developed for Google. I said, I look at this guy's name, it's Jeff Dean. Have you heard of it? I said, I kind of heard of it, but I really don't know him. He said, I look at his code, I look at his system. That's something I couldn't do. By the way, if you hear this from me, you probably say, hey, I don't know what Michelle's talking about. Because Michelle's not a very good graphic developer or software engineer. But my husband, I have to say, I'm very proud of him because he's one of the person who makes a, a very big part of the Goldman Sachs actually real-time risk analysis system. So he was looking at the Jeff stuff. He said, no, that's something I really couldn't do. That's the first story, how I got to know more about Jeff. Second very short story it is, uh, some of you have known that I kind of resigned from IBM recently. I started our new venture with a couple of my uh, actually colleagues. So one day we were looking at the, in WeChat. How many of you know WeChat? It's from Tencent, right? It's kind of like a WhatsApp. So WeChat, there was a long list of, um, a short list, actually top 10, the best uh, actually engineers, the best scientists, actually more on the system side uh, in the world. So then my uh, co uh, actually my co-founder, my CTO said this, someday I really want to be on the list. I said, wow, you're inspired. But who do you want to be? He looked at the list, he said, I want to be the top, the, the number three, number three one. Actually, he said, I said, who is the number three? That's you, Jeff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so actually they said the great things about that. If you know about WeChat, go check it out. So hey, with, without further ado, let me, uh, this is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Dean from Google. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch to that, I think. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk today about essentially doing very large scale deep learning models for a variety of different things. Some of these will be very relevant to recommendation systems. Some of them will be sort of things that I think deep learning is useful for that will eventually be useful for, for recommendations but are sort of more foundational things that allow us to build understanding of certain kinds of data. Uh, and this is joint work with a lot of colleagues at Google. This uh, work has, uh, you know, we have a lot of people doing deep learning research and systems work within our team, and then we've been collaborating with a number of different teams at Google. So there's probably 30 or 40 teams at Google using our systems to do a whole variety of different things. And I'll, you'll see some of that in here. So this is not my work alone. This is a joint work with a lot of people. Okay. so. In order to make my talk fit in this, this conference, I said, what is a recommendation? And I'm taking a really broad view, where basically a recommendation is anything a computer can su suggest to help a user. And at that point, we can now launch into a real talk about what we think we need to be able to do in order to do good recommendations. So one of the first things you really need for recommendations is context. So understanding what a user is doing is pretty vital. If a user is in San Francisco and they're looking at a map of the whole city, you know, that's a diff and they're asking for pizza. That's a pretty different thing. Maybe they're on their desktop computer. You know, that's one thing. 
But if they're in the middle of Minneapolis, right on the edge of a university campus, and they're looking for pizza, you might want a more focused recommendation that gives them, you know, the best pizza place that's within a few blocks. And if you know that they're walking, you know, that might be different than if they have a car. So really understanding context at this level, all the subtleties that it has associated with it, is really pretty important for understanding what information or what service you can give to a user at a particular time. Um, more specifically, you'd really like to really understand the user's surroundings. So if you're standing here on the street, you know, it's pretty useful to be able, for a computer system that's trying to give you recommendations, to be able to read that text, to understand what text is there, you know, that you could get the lowest prices there. That would be useful, wouldn't it? Um, or that, you know, that shop has gifts. So really understanding surroundings at the level of reading everything the user is seeing around you is going to be pretty vital and important. <clears throat> what else is required? Well, <clears throat> the previous behavior of the user. Here we have two users who've just entered the query pasta sauce recipes. Um, the user on the left, what can we infer about them given their previous queries? First of all, they're probably not a vegetarian, right? Second of all, they're probably not a super sophisticated cook. <laughs> um, the user on the right, you might infer they're more likely to be a vegetarian. Uh, you might infer they like kind of fancy food. You might infer stuff about their income level. Uh, chiffonading basil, I had to look that up. It's, uh, you know, some fancy cooking technique. So you can probably infer that they're a pretty sophisticated cook. And from these two users who've entered the same query, you probably want pretty different results, right? Uh, the one on the right might be totally happy with a vegetarian pasta sauce recipe that takes three hours to make. The one on the left probably would, well, probably they'd prefer a jar of sauce, but um, <laughs> maybe something simple with cut up some tomatoes and simmer them for a while. Okay. Um, the other thing that's useful, because users are often doing things that they've never done before or that are different than their past experience, you can't rely solely on that user's past experience. You know, it's very helpful to understand what other users have done in similar situations, especially in aggregate. Um, so for example, if a user starts by typing, how do I tie a, you know, there's a lot of different complete possible completions for that. And we can rely on aggregated behavior of lots of users to try to guess what the user might want to complete uh, that sort of prefix that they've typed. And that should probably be context sensitive, right? If, if I say, how do I put on a suit as my previous query? I can probably rule out how do I tie a slip knot and adjust the results there. <clears throat> um, finally, I think we really need a much better level of textual understanding in computer systems. You know, we don't really have that today. We have some techniques that kind of count how often different words occur and treat it as a big bag of words. But really, we need much better levels of textual understanding to know the actual sentiment being expressed in this kind of phrase. Um, and there's a lot of subtleties. You know, there's a lot of positive sounding words in there. So if you just treat it as a bag of words, it's not necessarily going to work. I'm in awe. Uh, you know, this uh, let, looks good. So it's not obvious that this is a pretty bad and damning review. But we really want to be able to understand text at the level of knowing what the sentiment is, knowing what's it, what it's about, and so on. OK. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of machine learning approaches in the world. Uh, in particular, they kind of lump into three different categories. There's supervised learning, where if you have lots of examples, you can build amazingly effective systems. And it turns out, if you look at different kinds of problems right, you can often come up with pretty large data sets where you might think, oh, I don't have any labeled examples. What am I going to do? But it may not actually be that hard to get some amount of labeled examples or get slightly noisy labeled examples from you know, user behavior on a website or something. And so you can actually use supervised learning in a much bigger set of contexts than you might think you might otherwise be able to. Um, the second technique is what I'll call discovering patterns, where you're doing unsupervised learning and you're essentially trying to look at a bunch of raw data where you don't quite know what you're trying to extract from it, but you just want a system that can discover interesting 
patterns in it, both at a very low level and also at higher and higher levels of abstraction. Now, I think unsupervised learning is still a pretty active research topic. It's not as useful for production systems if you have supervised examples. Um, it's only if you don't have good examples that you should really go to the route of unsupervised learning. <clears throat> and then there's systems that kind of take actions and get feedback about whether they did something right or wrong. Uh, that's reinforcement learning. Uh, so for example, you can learn to play chess by observing how well your system made moves and when they do something, when they lose, you can try to attribute credit or in this case blame to moves along the way that uh, probably caused you to lose. And that works well in some domains, it's becoming more important, but I think um, mostly what I'm going to focus on is how do you do supervised learning at large scale? So in particular, one of the things that we would like with machine learning systems is that we want techniques that really minimize software engineering effort. We'd like simple algorithms that are able to teach the computer how to learn from data. And we don't want to spend time hand engineering algorithms for particular precise things we're trying to do or to hand engineer high level features from the data. We'd like to dump in as much raw data about the system as we can and let the machine learning system work out what's important in this context, what, what's not important for the tasks I care about. Um, for example, for query prediction, you can imagine a pretty long list of things that could influence good query prediction for a user. Right? Uh, you know, I showed you some of the examples of like the previous query, you know, the, the long-term previous history of this user, but you can imagine other things like today's temperature, what day of the week is it, am I walking, am I standing at a podium and talking, am I, um, you, know, uh, you know, sitting in my house. All these things are features that could influence things, but you're not quite sure, right? And so you like systems where you can throw in lots of data <clears throat> and have the system build abstractions automatically. Okay. So this is going to be a gentle introduction to deep learning. My apologies if some of you already kind of know this material, but I thought it's worth going over. So what is deep learning? Essentially, it's the reincarnation of artificial neural networks in the 80s and 90s. So when I was a, an undergrad, I actually did my senior thesis on uh, parallel training of neural nets. So ironically, I am now back to this, um, but our neural nets went through this sort of hype cycle in the 80s and 90s where everyone thought they were going to be great for everything, and then they turned out to kind of work for toy problems, but they weren't really that effective because we didn't really know how to train really big, really deep ones on sort of real problem, you know, problem, problems with enough data that we cared about. Um, and so they kind of faded into oblivion for a little while, and they've been making a resurgence recently. But a lot of the techniques that we're do using today are essentially just the techniques from the 80s and 90s applied to much larger problems with much more computation. And being able to scale these problems up is actually what makes them work well. The fundamental abstractions that were developed there, plus some new techniques, uh, are pretty much what we're using today, just at a much larger scale. So, Neural nets are compatible with all three of those kinds of uh, machine learning things I described on the previous slide, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Uh, and it's essentially, a neural net is essentially a collection of simple trainable mathematical units. And all of these things collaborate to compute really complicated functions. Um, it's loosely inspired by what we know about the brain. So there's kind of two separate camps uh, about trying to build these biologically inspired models. Some, some of them are more interested in the neuroscience aspect of things, and they're actually trying to build very detailed simulations of, to a fairly precise level, what we know about how real neurons in the brain work. Um, the kinds of neural nets we train are sort of loosely inspired, but are more mathematically oriented. So we don't have, for example, spiking neurons, we just have a neuron that emits a floating point output va value. And that's kind of the fundamental building block of these models. Um, one interesting property about these models is that as you go through these layers, these mathematical transformations, these, the higher layers in these models form higher and higher levels of abstraction. So if you look at this thing where we're feeding in a raw image and we're trying to get out the label cat, the features learned at these low layers are gonna be very primitive things like 
what edges are at different orientations in this part of the image. And then as you get higher, it's going to be combinations of these things. So corners or crosses or uh, sh small smooth curves. Uh, maybe you know, you'll get a feature for part of an ear in a cat or something. And then as you get higher and higher, you'll get even higher level representations like the whole face of the cat or a uh, human uh, head, that kind of thing. OK, so neural nets learn this, these complicated functions from data. And how do they do that? So the fundamental building block is a neuron, which has some in set of inputs. And on each of these edges, it has a weight associated with that edge, which is how much I believe that input value. And so they compute a weighted sum of these inputs, and then they put it through some nonlinearity. So if you think back to the 80s and 90s, the nonlinearity people used was kind of a smooth sigmoid function. Uh, more recently, people have been using what's called a rectified linear unit, which is an uh, even simpler function. It's max of 0 and x, right? Um, this also has the nice property that you actually get sparsity in the activations of your neurons. So a lot of them will be actually 0 rather than just close to 0. And you can take advantage of that in some cases in some of the computations you're doing. OK, so different weights in a network, even if it has the same connection structure, compute different functions. Um, so if you look at this, we're going to put in some input into this model. And we're going to propagate it forward through the network, applying the weights uh, along all the connections. And then we'll get some output. <clears throat> so the way we train these algorithms is essentially doing small batches of examples and seeing did we get the desired output. This is for supervised training. So while we're not done, we're going to pick a random training case x where y is the desired output. We're going to run the network forward on x to see if we got y. If we got y, great, we're done. If we didn't get y, we're going to make little adjustments throughout the whole model to try to make the model's predictions closer to the desired output for that example. And then we're going to move on to the next example. And we just repeat this whole process. Um, how do we modify the connections? We use gradient descent. So that tells us the direction we should go to reduce the error. And you usually take a smaller step in that direction because these models are incredibly nonlinear. So you have a million parameter model. It's essentially like a million uh, dimensional function with all kinds of nonlinearities in it. So you have to take small steps so that you're kind of roughly in a smooth part of the function where the gradient in a small step takes you in roughly the right direction. If you take a big step, you might like go back up onto a plateau where you're trying to be down in this, this valley or canyon. OK, so what can neural nets compute? Well, if you look at human neural nets, uh, human perception is pretty fast. So in a tenth of a second, you have no problem doing all these different things. You can recognize that you know, that's a microphone. You can understand the words I'm saying. You can recognize if I'm happy or sad. And you can instantly see how to solve different problems. So if I need to pick up my phone, no problem. I just pick it up because I've computed the set of trajectories I need to make for my muscles and all these kinds of things. So uh, the interesting thing is <clears throat> a tenth of a second in human neuron firing times is not that long. You can go through about 10 sequentially uh, dependent neuron, human neurons in that time. So in a tenth of a second, you can see an image go through 10 sequential steps of neurons in your brain and then click a button if it's a cat or not. So that's pretty interesting uh, because it means that anything humans can do in a tenth of a second, the right, uh, that's a pretty important word, <laughs> big, also another important word, 10-layer network can do too, right? And big. <laughs> OK. So here's some examples of functions that artificial neural networks can learn. So we can do what I showed in the previous slide. You take in an image, the raw pixels of the image, so many pixels, so many pixels, red, green, and blue, and you can output a mostly correct label for that image. You know, the recent ImageNet challenge was run by a team at Google that's using our one by a team at Google that's using our deep learning software. And they were getting about 6% uh, error in the top five examples for 1,000 classes of images. So computers are actually pretty good now at taking a raw image and saying, what is the dominant sort of 
label a human would associate with that image. Uh, a, a human actually did this exact same task with the same thousand set of categories and got about 5% error. And another human got 12% error, but they, they got bored more quickly, didn't study the thousand categories as much. Um, we can take in raw audio waveforms and produce you know, a sequence of words, but also kind of the intermediate pieces, the predictions of what are the parts of words that make up that audio waveform. We can take in a query and two documents and features about those documents and give you a probability that the user will prefer document one over document two. And perhaps surprisingly, we can take in a sequence of text, feed it just through a neural net, a deep, big, right neural network, and just start emitting French. And I'll tell you a little bit more about these, these works. OK. Um, so let me focus a little bit on the system side of things for a moment. Uh, in particular, when we're doing these deep learning experiments, um, one of the things we really want is to minimize the time to getting our results. Because that allows us to iteratively do many more experiments in the same actual wall time. Um, so everyone has some sort of patience threshold that they're willing to wait for uh, the outcome of some experiment. And usually, for most people, if you ask them, yeah, I don't want to wait more than a few days or maybe weeks. And on a smaller scale, you know, I'd like to be able to turn around experiments in a few hours. Right? If you have to wait weeks and weeks and weeks for every iteration of your experimental pipeline, you're not going to make very good progress. So because that significantly affects the scale of the problems that can be tackled, one of the things we've focused a lot on in our group is being able to turn around training of very large networks on very large data sets quickly. And as part of that, we sometimes optimize for experimental turnaround time rather than absolute minimal resource usage. If we trained a model on a single GPU for six weeks, we would use less absolute wall time resources uh, than if we trained it on a lot of computers in a day. But if we're able to train in a day what a single GPU card can do in six weeks, we'll probably make more rapid sort of scientific progress. OK, so how can we train big nets quickly? Uh, and there's a couple of different techniques we use, actually a few more. But I'm going to focus on two. Uh, one is what I'll call model parallelism, and the other is data parallelism. So in these models, this is kind of a fairly abstract view of an image model. Um, we have neurons that take in small pieces of input from the layer below them. So at the lowest layer, they take in a small patch of pixels and do some computation and produce some sort of output. And then in the next layer, they, those take in a, kind of a small cube of neuron activations and produce slightly sort of higher level represent, representing neurons. Um, so one of the things you can do to make your model faster, train faster, is essentially to partition all the computation you're doing in this model across multiple devices or multiple computers. Um, and so by doing that, uh, and especially with these models that have these local connections, you can eff effectively partition things fairly well without needing too much communication across network boundaries. So for example, the, all but the second neuron from the left here, their inputs are entirely local to the computer that they're on. And only the middle one, the, the second from the left, straddles the, the boundary there and, and needs communication from one computer to another. So you can actually do this while still having not too much communication across these uh, network boundaries. Uh, so you know, we train models of a variety of sizes. Some of the biggest ones we've trained are use 144 machines and like a 12 by 12 grid uh, and sort of do that level of parallelism within a single model. OK. Um, so the second thing that we do to speed up training is we'll actually take one copy of the model, which might be on many computers, and then we'll stamp out lots of different copies of the model, um, which then all process different subsets of the data. So if we look at this, there's one copy of a model, and they're going to cooperate to train the weights, the parameters of the model, are all going to be in this central service. So um, 
before processing a small amount of data, this model downloads the current copy of the parameters from the centralized service. It processes a set of examples, computes the gradients, figures out what adjustments it would like to make the parameters, and then sends it on to this centralized parameter service to make the adjustments. And that thing adjusts the parameters. Meanwhile, it's going to do another step, so it gets the new copy of the parameters and sends a new copy there. And those parameters get updated again. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, it's all asynchronous, right? All these models are running independently and um, are updating the parameters as quickly as they're able to do so. So in the time that the left model downloaded P prime, some other model might have quickly run a step, downloaded P prime, and up sent a gradient about P prime to the centralized service. So the parameters may have moved in the meantime before this guy gets around to computing his gradient. Um, so non-convex models like neural nets already make theoreticians nervous because we don't really understand much about nonlinear models. And asynchronous updates to nonlinear models make them even more nervous. Uh, the good news is it all kind of works. So, uh, and we've been successfully training models kind of depending on how densely connected they are and how sparsely the gradient updates all the parameters in the model um, with between 10 and 1,000 replicas of the model. Okay, so the good news is we also have plenty of data for which these kinds of models uh, we'd like, uh, would like to be applied. You know, lots of textual data in lots of different languages. We have lots of visual data, including images and videos. So if you thought image models were expensive, think about processing all the video stream clips for images uh, in a corpus like YouTube. You need a lot of computation to do that. Um, and lots of audio and lots of user activity, which can help with these predictive and recommend recommendation systems. Okay, so let me just quickly go through a few examples of kind of more perceptual kinds of things that neural nets can do, and then I'll talk more about how they can be applied to sparser problems. So one of the first things we did was uh, built deep learning systems to do acoustic modeling for speech. I already sort of mentioned this, but you put in raw audio waveform and you get out a sequence of predictions about parts of words. Um, and the good news is this significantly dropped the word error rate for recognition. Uh, so a 30% reduction in word error rate for English is huge. There's been about, a, about that much in the last sort of 15 or 20 years of speech recognition. Uh, and this, using a large neural net, produced a comparable gain to that. Um, and that was launched at the time of the Jelly Bean release. We've continued to make the model better and bigger and launched it for lots of other languages. Um, so this slide's kind of busy, but the essential idea is you want to do supervised training of image recognition, the problem with the ear and outputting the label ear. Um, and these models actually work pretty effectively. So we can now assign labels from the raw pixels uh, that are pretty accurate. So we can say that's a hibiscus, that's a dahlia. You know, the training data represents lots of images labeled with meal, some of which are close up and some of which are far, so it's able to recognize kind of both of these contexts as meal. Um, it makes kind of sensible errors. You know, it says snake for that, but well, I don't know what it is. <laughs> It says dog, it's a goat or a donkey, I think, I don't know. Um, and it works in practice. So on Google Plus, you can now search photos that people have shared with you or, the, or your own photos without tagging them. So you can type in statue or whatever and, you know, so a real user said, new Google Plus photo search is a bit insane, I didn't tag those. So it's able to help this user find um, their pictures more effectively without them going through the labor of tagging them. Uh, you know, I found all my scribbles. If you're gonna have, you know, a few categories for your image classifier, one of them should be Yoda, probably. And they can also do a pretty effective job of more focused visual tasks. So for example, you'd like to be able to detect all the text in kind of arbitrary street scenes and then be able to read all that text. So the first step to reading is finding the text and then being able to read it. And so this is a model that my summer intern from uh, previous summer uh, trained to detect text in street scenes. And you see it works pretty well. It's, um, you know, 
it's pretty resilient to the color of the text or the font size. There's all kinds of different fonts represented. You know, that the house number over there is in yellow. Um, but it all kind of works because the training data had enough representatives of different fonts and scripts and so on that the model just learns to find it. Okay, so the goal of that section was to convince you that for dense perceptual problems, these kinds of models work pretty well. But a lot of the domains we care about, especially in this conference probably, are ones where we have much sparser representations of input data. So what do we mean by that? So something like the query Palo Alto restaurants. It's three words. We have a pretty big vocabulary of words the users could type. And if let's say our vocabulary is 10 million uh, elements, then we have a 10 million dimensional vector with a handful of non-zero values. Non-zero for Palo and Alto and restaurants. Or, um, and so we can represent that as a bag of tokens with some weights maybe. Um, probably we have slightly more kinds of data than just the query, like we might want to be able to match ads, so we have a query and we have the keywords for some ad and we have the language of the user and some previous queries. Um, and we want to kind of take all this state and context and be able to put it into a system and then be able to make predictions out of that model. So how do we do that? You know, if we're able to do that, there's plenty of different applications for this. You know, we can improve search, we can do better text understanding, we could do translation, um, all these kinds of things, but it's not obvious how to make a neural network play well with these kinds of sparse data. Um, and fortunately, there's an answer, and the answer is embeddings. So we're gonna represent individual elements in our vocabulary, say different words or short phrases, by a dense vector. Let's call it a thousand dimensional vector. I've drawn some of the dimensions here. Um, but the idea is we want to represent it in such a way that words that mean similar things or have similar semantics or syntax are near each other in this high dimensional space. So we'd like dolphin and porpoise to share the same sense of porpoise. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> And we'd like SeaWorld, which is kind of related to be kind of nearby. But we'd like the word camera or Paris to be pretty far apart from porpoise and dolphin because they're not really that related. So by representing these points in this very high dimensional space, um, we can actually do a pretty effective job of transforming sparse inputs into dense inputs, the kinds of things that neural nets really excel at, at manipulating and, and operating on and learning interesting combinations of things. So the question is, how do we learn these things? Uh, it turns out, um, so here's an example of a model you might use for a predictive task. I want to predict uh, maybe um, is, uh, you know, is the user likely to click on this ad? So I have embeddings of all the words in the query and all the words in the ad, and I have some deep neural net layers, I have an embedding, so I get vectors out of it, I concatenate the vectors together, I put them through some dense layers, and then I predict, using my supervised data, did I get the right answer? If not, I can back, back propagate adjustments, gradients, through the deep part of the model, and then I can actually back propagate through the embedding. So I make little adjustments to where things are in the embedding space to make them better able to predict this example. So I can jointly train the embedding and the rest of the parameters of the model at the same time on a supervised task. That's pretty important. So you can actually initialize the embedding totally randomly, thousand random numbers, close to zero, and then you just start pushing words around as you discover they're more related or less related. So here's another way you can train these embeddings. This is a, a model developed by Tomasz Mikulov to do, uh, pretty, take the embedding for one word at the center of, say, a 20-word window, you pick one other word nearby, and then you try to predict that word from the embedding for the central word. So we're gonna use the embedding for Obama's and look it up in our embedding space, and then we're gonna just try to predict Putin from that. And so we're gonna push Putin and the embedding for Obama a little bit uh, around so that we're better able to predict Putin from Obama's. 
and it actually works pretty well. So if you look at a trained embedding model and you look at, you take, we actually had short phrases in our vocabulary in addition to words. If you look at the nearest neighbors for the phrase tiger shark, these are the terms you find. If you look at the nearest neighbors for the word car, you know, those are the words you find. And you can see it's captured a lot of kind of interesting both syntactic thing, like the plural of car is there, cars, um, some slight variants like muscle car and sports car and compact car, but also synonyms like automobile, uh, passenger car, dealership. Um, all these things are kind of word that capture the essence of the word car and they're all nearby in this embedding space. Or New York, you know, you have other locations that are related to New York. So these vectors actually have pretty interesting properties once you've trained them. Uh, turns out you can actually, not only is nearness in the space meaningful, but directions are meaningful as well. So for example, if I wanna say hot is to hotter as big is to what? I can transform that a little bit. And I can essentially just take the embedding vectors, do linear operations on them, and take hotter minus hot plus big and I actually get that the nearest neighbor to that is bigger. Or Rome minus Italy plus Germany gives me Berlin. It's pretty cool, right? And that's, that's amazing. And you know, you can do 57% on some fairly large set of analogies uh, here, which I think might be a almost passing grade in the SAT, I don't know. It's not a great score, but it's not a terrible score. So if we visualize the embedding space, you know, the embedding space is a thousand dimensions, but we can project it down to two dimensions via principal components analysis. And then we can see how some words and other related words line up in this space. And what you see is that a few things. One is you go roughly the same direction and distance to get from a country to its corresponding capital or vice versa if you go the other direction. Um, but you also see hints of the other structures that are present in this high dimensional space, right? In particular, you see countries in the vertical direction are oriented more towards how you'd expect them to be uh, sort of related. So European countries are the top, Vietnam is, is closer to China than it is to Spain. So you see the hints of subtle structures in lots of different directions in these, in these embeddings. Here's one more visualization, again projected down to two dimensions via PCA. And you see that different forms of the same verb form the same kind of triangular relationships in the projected embedding space. So fell, fall, and fallen are all kind of in this triangular arrangement and it's uniform across different verbs. Okay, I hope, I hope you agree with that. Embeddings seem useful. What about longer pieces of text? Okay, so embeddings essentially give you this really nice property that I have a piece of text, a short piece of text, a word or maybe a two word phrase or something like that, and a point in the space is meaningful, right? It has semantic meaning to be here as opposed to here. So can we do this with long pieces of text? It would be really nice if we could have the same property hold for, say, a whole sentence, right? If two sentences mean the same thing, that they were nearby in some high dimensional space and a sentence that means something very different was not nearby. If we could do that, you know, Rapungi weather and is it raining in Tokyo should be nearby in this high dimensional space and record temps in J Japan's capital should be kind of nearby. So one way you can try to get a sentence representation is take the embeddings for words and phrases, which actually are semantically meaningful, and combine them somehow. You could concatenate them, you could average them. And turns out, for fairly short pieces of text, just averaging the embeddings works pretty well. That, that's pretty interesting. So like up to five or six words, the sum of the embeddings of the individual words and in the short piece of text is actually a pretty meaningful representation of the whole piece of text. But when you get to longer sequences of text, 
That doesn't really capture ordering, for example, which seems sort of important for understanding language. Um, and uh, it sort of breaks down because it all kind of gets washed out. If you add up 100 embedding vectors, it just doesn't work that well. So we need some sort of more powerful model for representing larger pieces of text. And I'll talk to you about two different approaches we've been exploring that seem to be working pretty well. So one of them is something I'll call paragraph vectors. The idea is we're going to have some local context, some nearby words to something, uh, but we're also going to have a representation and embedding for an entire paragraph. And we're going to, in the same way we pushed words around in the high dimensional space, we're going to push the representation of that paragraph around or that sentence. I, I call it paragraph vectors, but it can actually be lots of different things. Um, and then the second technique is sort of sequential or recurrent neural networks or LSTMs, long short-term memories. These are sort of special versions of neural nets where instead of just feeding information forward, we actually cycle back and have recursive connections for sequential time steps. So the state in the next time step depends on the state in the previous time step. Okay. So in the same way we want nearby words to be near each other in the space, we'd like nearby documents that are very similar to be nearby in this paragraph space. So how are we going to do that? So here's one language model you could use that uses some nearby context to try to predict the next word. So I can take the embeddings of the four previous words, concatenate them together, and then try to predict the fifth word. Right? And that'll do a pretty good job, right? A lot of times, the previous four words, especially in this embedding space, you can actually say, oh, well, you know, jumped is probably a pretty plausible candidate for, for that. Um, what we're going to add to this, though, is the ability to represent the whole paragraph that contains those five words with an embedding. And now we're going to have an embedding for the f previous four words plus the embedding for the paragraph and represent that whole thing as a concatenation, and then try to predict the word jumped. And so that means we have this embedding matrix on the side that is proportional in size to the number of training paragraphs in our corpus. Now you might be thinking, well, what if I come upon a paragraph that I haven't trained on, like a new paragraph? Uh, I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. So the idea is this paragraph vector is going to ca capture the complementary non-local information that you need to help predict that word better. So when I get a new paragraph, I don't have a vector for that paragraph yet. So what I'm actually going to do is freeze the rest of the model, initialize a vector for the new paragraph I've never seen before, and then do a few iterations of gradient descent adjusting only the new paragraphs vector. At the end of that, after 40 or 50 iterations or something, picking little bits of text out of the paragraph and training, I now have an embedding representation for that paragraph that's a new paragraph. And now I can operate just as a, it was one of my training paragraphs. So I now have a high dimensional representation for that longer bit of text. And there's an archive paper you can look up for the details.